time to begin this evening. Please take a songbook and turn to number 255. 255. <clears throat> Oh, did they like the blessed Redeemer? This is my constant longing and prayer. Glad you are forfeit, all of his treasures. Jesus, my perfect, like to see where. Oh, did like me, oh, did he like me? stand for the prayer while Brother Rex leads us. Pray with me, please. Loving God, our Father, we're so thankful that we have this opportunity to come together as thy children. We realize, Father, as as children, we need guidance and we need correction. Father, we know that the law has taught us that to love thee with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul, our whole spirit, and to love others as ourselves. That's the basis of that law. But we, Father, we know that in your mercy, when we break that law, you have offered us forgiveness through your Son, Jesus, our Savior. As we go about our daily lives, Father, we work with others, we see each other, 
We may not know our fellow Christian's weaknesses, but Father, we know that our fellow Christian has them, just as all humans have them. But we know, Father, our fellow Christians have made the same commitment that we have to try, to strive, to follow thy rule with love and compassion. And so, Father, as we gather as this group here, we're so thankful we can come together and help to bear each other's burdens, recognizing that each one of us is individually responsible to do the things that we're supposed to do. But when we're together, we're with like precious faith, and we receive such support and love. We pray that that would abound here, that each one of us would come closer to the other, that we would all serve thee, Father, and as such be a shining light in our community, that others might be led to you. Father, we realize that many of us have experienced illness of the body in various ways. For those who are recovering and back with us, we're so very thankful and pray that you would continue to minister those who need thy service so that all that are in thy will might be able to return to us whole in body, mind, and spirit. And Father, we realize that there may be one or more in this group tonight who have not yet named the name of Jesus as their Savior, but hopefully something might be said or done in the very near future, if not yet this hour, that they might come to thee through Jesus. Father, we realize that every day we need thy strength and we call upon thee for it. We realize, Father, that we have our weaknesses and beg forgiveness. And at this time, we would ask that you go with us through this service and on down life's pathway. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 251. 251. <clears throat> Sweet is the promise, I will not forget thee. Nothing can possess or bring my soul away. In the night, the carpet and the valley cast me on the shining and eternal day. We'll sing number 600, 600.
before we have the reading tonight, I have one announcement updating you on. And keep him in your prayers. It's always good to see everyone, and as has already been expressed, we appreciate uh, God giving us, granting us the health to be out and to worship him in spirit and truth and to enjoy the fellowship and association together with uh, Christians, and we're glad that you're here. Uh, the reading tonight comes from 2 Timothy 1, verses 3 through 5, that Paul wrote to the young evangelist and said, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee uh, also. Now, we are affected by Timothy's grandmother in this passage at verse 5 that I just read. The Bible's teaching about how far reaching one person's faithful influence can be is easily seen in this statement that Paul makes to Timothy. Uh, Timothy's grandmother Lois set a precedent for us all. And I want to say some things this evening, and some of you have probably been amused at the title of this lesson uh, about green bean casserole. And I thought I'd just ask, don't raise your hands, but should I ask you, over the holidays, how many of you had green bean casserole? Well, probably everybody would raise their hand. You may like it, may not like it, but it, perhaps it was offered to you. Then somebody would say, well, what in the world does that have to do with the gospel or with the Bible lesson? And so I'm going to try to show you by an example of green bean casserole, uh, just the kind of influence that brought that about and how the same type of influence can affect us as well as our peers and those around us. McDonald's started with Ray Kroc hamburgers. Uh, many of you may remember that uh, back in, I think, 55. And then he went international with big name advertising. Uh, the same is true with General Motors. Uh, incorporated several makes of cars and then advertised on a, a big name scale. So they went from the individual cars to General Motors. And that became their um, uh, notation as far as advertising is concerned. Henry Ford did the same thing. Uh, so did Johnson & Johnson with big name advertising to promote their products. So green bean casserole is different because the dish itself never went viral from a big name commercial. As a matter of fact, the recipe itself was created by one woman. Her name was Dorcas Riley. And where she worked as a kitchen manager in 1955 was Campbell Soups. And she, uh, they, they, in turn, did not really promote her creation, even though it was made at that time in their kitchen. And from her sole effort, um, and by word of mouth, eventually Campbell's did print the formula on their canned labels. In fact, statistically, and this was kind of an astonishing thing to me, 40% of all Campbell's condensed cream of mushroom soup, about $20 million worth, ends up in a green bean casserole. And so that's just kind of interesting from the standpoint of everyday things that we are acquainted with. Initially, however... This recipe was handed down, as I said, by, by word of mouth and via the soup can labels. No major national or international advertising. And the result is that Mrs. Riley was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame back in 2002. And she has donated her original, now yellowed 8.5 by 11 recipe card that is placed alongside a Fermi's first controlled nuclear reactor, and Edison's light bulb and phonograph in the Hall of Fame Museum. Just from the one woman's effort to have the status she now has. What one person did, this Dorcas Riley, has now become what one writer said is a national tradition. There are cooks and others who like the taste and the simplicity of green bean casseroles, and so they passed the recipe on. They said, look what we made. And this, uh, some of them weren't even sure where it came from. But as I said, they, they tracked it down. And a chain was begun and continues 
adding links even now. So we can do the same. This is my point. We can do the same thing today with the greatest feast of all. We can share God's word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation, the abundant of the abundance of godly living. And we add to this the thought of 2 Timothy chapter 2 at verse 2. Paul said, And the things that you have heard from me among the many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's the formula. It tastes the best. The recipe is simple. And we joyfully pass it on one generation after another. Now one person's influence, and this is the point of all this, can make so much difference in so many lives. And I want to learn from some Bible lessons on just what uh, one person's influence might have. For example, we go back into the Old Testament of 1 Samuel chapter 10, or 19 and verses 1 through 7 and learn what a good friend can do in his or her influence toward another friend. Think about this. Just pick in your mind right now somebody that's a good close friend of yours and what influence they have had on you or you have had on them. Oftentimes in my prayers, and I've kind of been sharing that with you, but I, I will thank the Lord for those who I have influenced their lives and especially those who have influenced me who have brought me to the, the point that I'm at in this life. And there have been a lot of people that have influenced me, and I, I regard them, and I'm thankful for them. And I pray that I have touched some of their lives. Well, you may have one or more friends that you are intimate with as far as that friendship, that fellowship, that association is concerned. But we find the example in 1 Samuel 19, and verse 1. Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants but that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Now, therefore, I pray you, take heed to thyself unto the morning, and abide in the secret place, and hide yourself. And I will go out, I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art, and I will commune with my father of thee, and what I see, that I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke good of David and to Saul and his father and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you and because his works have been to thee word very good. And verse 5 of 1 Samuel 19 continues, For he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it and didst rejoice Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan. And Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David. And Jonathan showed him all the things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul. And he was in his presence as in times past. Now adding to that, over in 1 Samuel 20, verses 3 and 4, David swore moreover and said, Thy father certainly knows that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he says, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord lives and as the soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever your soul desires, I will even do it for you. This putting your life on your line for your friends. Jesus taught in, in John chapter 15 and verse 14 and chapter also chapter 14 and verse 15 that a greater man has no a greater friend, greater love has no man than this than a man would lay down his life for his friends. This is exactly the relationship that Jonathan and David had. And even at the expense of offending, perhaps offending his father, Jonathan says, I will go to bat for you, my friend David, and I will convince my father not to slay you. Well, you think about that principle and you think about parents and sons and you think about your own children and we as children look toward our parents and even our parents look toward us in a father-child, mother-child relationship. And I go back in the Old Testament again, this time to Asa's influence on Jehoshaphat. In 1 Kings 22, verses 42 and 43, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother name, mother's name was Azubah, 
the daughter of Shilhai. And he walked in the ways, all the ways of Asa, his father. He turned not aside from it, doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. How many times have you seen a little boy follow in the footsteps of his father? Following right behind him. A father, a grandfather, one who he loves and appreciates. That's what we're seeing in this picture here. Amaziah and Jechaliah's father and mother. Influence on Azariah is told. In the 20 and 7th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amaziah, the king of Judah, to reign. 2 Kings 15 and verse 2. 16 years old when he was, was he when he began to reign. And he reigned 2 and 50 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Now see the influence of these fathers over their sons. You think about your own relationship. How many times have you in your prayers thank God for the example of your father setting the precedent before you, setting the example for you? How many times have you thanked the Lord for your mother, that she was the, the most loving mother of all as far as you were concerned? And she taught you right from wrong and she told you the things that were true. But I want us to notice even with this great influence, there's a negative side to this, that even with good influence from parents and even their actions were not all pleasing to God as they lived on. Because the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, is that Ezra had a mind of his own. You ever met a child like that? <laughs> sure we have. As the children begin to grow and to mature, they go through puberty and adolescence and they begin to develop their own thought processes and they make up their minds. And sometimes we put our hands on our hips and say, she has a mind of her own. He has a mind of his own. It's kind of a natural thing, the natural process of maturing and growing. But this resulted in this situation, in Azariah's eventual downfall, because he did not do all that the Lord expected. And neither had his father and his mother when it came down to it. They may have appeared to be good on the surface. But deep down inside, in 2 Kings 15 and verse 4 and 5, save that the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burnt incense still on the high places. And the Lord smote the king so that he was a leper until the day of his death and dwelt in a several house. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the house, judging the people of the land. And the rest of the acts of Azariah, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Azariah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Jotham his son reigned in his stead. And so we have great expectations and hope as we try to nurture our children, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to borrow a phrase from Ephesians 6, 1-4. through But again, we have to take into consideration that they develop and they have minds of their own. But hopefully, as Solomon wrote in Proverbs 22 and verse 6, we have planted the seed in their minds so that when they are older, they'll not depart from the faith, but they will, they will grow and they will mature as they should. Well, at this same book that we're talking about here in 2 Kings, we go to verses 32 through 38. We have the parental influence of Isaiah, uh, Jerusha, father and mother on Jotham. And the Bible says in the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, began Joseph, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jerisha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right beside the Lord, and did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Boys walking in the footprints of their fathers. Howbeit, verse 35, the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places. He built the higher gates of the house of the Lord. And the rest of the acts of Jotham and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In those days the Lord began to send against Judah Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah. And Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father. And Ahaz his son raised, uh, reigned in his stead. Now I want us to talk for just a moment, having read those scriptures, about what I'm calling the candle influence metaphor. You see the picture of the candle in the basket 
there on the screen. We go to Mark, the fourth chapter, at verse 21. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be put on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. What we're suggesting is the candle influence is the light influence. And nothing is hidden in darkness, and darkness is the absence of light. And even if you have a, sometimes we refer to the phrase, a flicker of hope, that may not be enough to sustain you in doing all the good things you're supposed to do. There is a flicker of hope and anticipation and perhaps even eagerness, and that may be transfer, transferred to your children, but until they have the bright light of the Lord, they may falter into darkness. And that happens so much of the time. Luke puts it, or excuse me, the, the psalmist puts it this way in Psalms 119 and verse 105. Thy word, that is God's word, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now these kings and their fathers and their mothers that we talked about, the mothers even named in this record of the Chronicles and in Kings. And they had good intentions, but notice again, they didn't do everything that the Lord wanted done. They still left the high idolatrous places. They didn't take care of everything. And sometimes fathers and mothers are a little hesitant to be too strict on their children. And subsequently, it involves the children not appreciating authority. I'm not saying this happens in every case, but it's something that happened in the Old Testament we see in these examples. And this is why even with a light to shine before your children, unless it's the kind of light that is coming from God, this bright light, it may not be powerful enough to fully convince them. Luke says in Luke the 11th chapter at verse 33, no man when he has lighted a candle puts it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. That glowing ember, that flicker, that battery's almost dead flashlight may not be enough to sustain you. He ends in verse 36 by saying, If thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle does give the light. And so as we are considering all of these things, the, the believer's influence, shall we say. In John 7, 37 through 39, these passages say, In the last days, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. For this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. We do have now the Holy Ghost, and he is able to produce in us flowing rivers of living water. And the candle influence and what is brought about with the influence in Philippians 2 and verse 5 that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. The believer sheds light and pours forth living water. Does that describe you? Is that a pretty good description of you and your eagerness to serve the Lord and to shine a bright light? Not just for your children, but for everyone else around you? People that you have influenced and they have influenced you. Well, this last concept we're dealing with tonight is the husband and wife relationship. In 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 through 16, he talks here about their relationship and some problems that may happen. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. This is a mutual admiration society consisting of two people. The wife has not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that they come together as one. And so he is building on this pre uh, premise back in the 6th chapter, here now in the 7th chapter. At verse 5, he gives this instruction. Defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So he is saying, work out your problems. If you separate for a time, go, go in different corners of the room and think this through, or maybe go outside and she stays inside or vice versa. But the idea is, well, I'm, not, I'm leaving. I'm just going to show you. That's not what he's saying. He is saying that you need some time to rationalize, to think this through. And coupling this with the Ephesians 4 passage where Paul says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, I understand at least the inference in that is that problems ought to be solved before the sun sets. Don't think this thing of separated, legal separation and, and trying to prove one another wrong or right or whatever. I don't think that's what the scriptures are talking about. I believe in this 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5, at verse 6, I speak this by, by permission and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. So we're all different is what he's saying. He says, I say therefore to the unmarried and with those it is good for them if they abide even as I. Paul wasn't married. So if you don't have the responsibility of wife, remain that way, he is saying, if you're really concentrating on serving the Lord in that capacity. However, there are extenuating circumstances. If they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. It's perfectly fine to get married. It's all right with the Lord to marry because you can work together. As it said, you become one in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And so Paul in chapter 7 again is building on this formula. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. And this is what, when it does then talk about the physical separation. But to the rest speak I not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believes not that she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which has an husband that believes not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Why do you suppose that's so? For the very reason that he goes into, Peter goes into this same subject in 1 Peter chapter 3. The influence that she as a wife may have over her unbelieving husband. Don't give up hope until you just, <laughs> there is no more hope. But always there is that hope, as Peter says, and as Paul is saying here. Don't leave them hanging, but rather try to influence them for the good. This is what we're talking about. That one-on-one -on -one influence. It doesn't take a national advertising scheme to influence somebody. You can take one can of cream mushroom soup, and you can add some green beans, and through that influence you can come up with a pretty good dish. And as I said, it wasn't advertised nationally until all of this came into focus. But this passage continues, as, as I said a while ago in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. You have influence on him. That's what he's saying. If the roles are reversed, the, wife, the husband can have the same kind of influence on the wife. So we're talking then about personal work. Not just in a husband and wife relationship. But personal work can be most influential. You know, years ago, when I over 50 years ago when I started preaching, we used to have what we call personal work classes. Some of you younger ones maybe haven't even heard of that. We don't, we don't do that anymore. We, we ought to. We should. Well, I concentrate on it. But it's a thing of the past as far as this generation is concerned. We encourage people to hold Bible studies. We encourage them to teach their neighbors and influence their peers. I'll tell you, that's a lost art. And I say that to my shame as well as to your shame. Because we just don't spend and put forth the effort. And I, you know, we can excuse ourselves and say, well, people just aren't interested. Well, a lot of people have never been interested. But there are some churches of Christ that are indeed growing because they are putting forth the effort to influence others. In 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 6-8, through 8, 
And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were in samples or examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Well, the final point is labeled after you're gone. We leave a legacy, a reputation, a status that we develop while we are living. And after we are gone, we can be remembered for the good influence that we have had. Surely you fall into one of these categories that we have mentioned this evening. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaks. Even when you're dead and gone. What do people say about you? Right away they're going to miss you. But after a while, will your influence be such that people say, I remember when brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, and, and you know that has affected me all my life. I called a preaching friend of mine just this past week and I said, I want you to know that you're helping me to get started preaching 50 odd years ago. And there were several men that did this. But I said, I just want you to know that you are in my prayers every day. because, And I mentioned you specifically by name. Because I was so greatly influenced that I am where I am today because of his starting me off. And as I said, there are several like that. And some of them, and perhaps you can think the same way. You know, I, I think of uh, some of you old, old timers here. Remember back Spencer High School? Was it Mrs. Rennie? Any of you remember Mrs. Rennie, the typing teacher? Yeah, so you, you remember, you're not that old. How do you remember me? <laughs> Mrs. Rennie. And, and you know, and, and uh, Morgan Drescher and then Jerry Warmouth were band directors. And, and I learned to play keyed instruments, saxophone, clarinets, oboes, and all that sort of thing. And I think about the, the typing that I do now. And what an influence was, and back to Mrs. Rennie and the, the, the band directors. There's a certain way that you have to play these keys, either on a typewriter or on a saxophone. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And I remember Mrs. Rennie in particular in typing class, and, and I wasn't at the top of the class with typing, but I wasn't the worst either. But she says, if you put your, you learn where the home keys are, she said, and follow my system for two weeks, I'll guarantee you, you'll never leave it. And you know what? I think about her every time I'm in that office, just about every time, thinking about sitting down the keyboard and how I learned that. Because she taught me and influenced me just as I, I love the music and the band directors that I had great appreciation for. That they taught me certain fundamentals that still hold true even today, that you have a, a music appreciation. I took music appreciation class at Indiana State where I planned on being a band director. And music theory kind of did me in because I... I we kind of got lost in music theory, but and so I pursued other routes. But all I'm saying is these are personal with me because they have people have influenced me over the years. I had an opportunity to return some of that. When we lived in Connersville, I took on some, some beginning students for saxophone and clarinet, and they'd come to my house and, and I teach them the fundamentals. And I don't know what's happened to them, but you know, you, you kind of pass this on. So you influence it. If you follow the teacher, if you follow the directions, and this is what Peter and Paul and all of these men are saying, you have followed us so that we have taught you the truth. And you know the light, and you know how that influence has changed your life. And so, as I said, we're leaving a legacy behind us. In Genesis 4, verses 8 through 10, hear the symbolic language of Moses. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his, Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Yep, you sure are. You are your brother's keeper. If for no other reason, the influence that you have on him or he has on you. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries to me from the ground. We may not do what Jesus did in leaving an inheritance through a will that provides for eternal life. Only he could do that. But we can influence those around us to prepare 
for the judgment day. In Hebrews 12, verse 24, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So here we are at this final slide, putting all of this together. The influence, the personal influence that we have, the husband and wife relationship, as I said, all of these things that have been granted unto us, and while we have the hope of eternal salvation, we sustain that hope by hearing the call of the Lord, letting His light shine, influencing us to carry on in our generation that those following behind us may have the right to salvation. You know, Jesus said in John 1 and verse 12, you have the right to salvation. And we want to teach that everyone has that right. Not just a privilege, but it's a right. And so we come to God hearing His call and rendering obedience. If you need to obey the gospel tonight, please come. All together we stand and sing. <laughs> table remains prepared. If there is anybody here this evening that still needs to partake of the Lord's Supper, if you raise your hand, I will serve you. Let us pray. Dear, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for this day that you have given us and the time that we have to do as which we're commanded to do each Lord's Day. Lord, we're thankful for this bread that we have and the privilege of partaking of it. We pray that you will be with the one partaking of it this evening and that she partakes of it in a way that is pleasing and acceptable to you. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Did I overlook anyone? Let us pray. In like manner, Father, we're thankful for this fruit of the vine, which to us is Christ's blood that was shed on the cross. We're thankful for the opportunity to partake of this each Lord's Day. We pray that the one partaking of this this evening does so in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable to you. Once again, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Separate and aside from the Lord's Supper, we also have the opportunity to give. In a moment, I'm going to ask Kevin to lead us in a closing prayer. Are there any sick that we've overlooked today that we need to mention? If not, uh, if you're visiting with us, we appreciate your presence. Come back anytime you can. We'll be meeting Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, next Lord's Day morning, 9.45 for Bible study and 10.30 for worship. And again, 6 p.m. There's nothing further. Uh, business meeting immediately following for the men. Nothing further. Stan will be dismissed in part. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we've been able to come to worship you this day. Thank you for the lessons that we've heard, the songs we've sung, the prayers. We pray that everything that we've done today has been pleasing and helpful in my sight to worship you that will. Thank you for all the many blessings you give us today. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for thy word. We pray that we'll always use it as our guide and our authority. We pray that we live with us and lead our lives this week, that it will be fruitful and we will be influential. Those that we come in contact with will use the opportunities that we have to help to spread thy will. We pray that you'll be with those that have been mentioned today, uh, this number that are sick, those that need your care, that those that are caring for them, that they will be beneficial, that they may well. You know, those that are spiritually sick, that those that need to name my name, that need to come to you, but then we might say something, or one other might say something, that will help them to see the air in their way, and come back, come in. Obey thy will. Guide us as we leave. Forgive us for our sins. We pray in Jesus' name.